Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to The Walker. My name is Pavel Pesh. I'm curator of visual arts and curator of the exhibition The Body Electric, which just opened last night and is on view in uh, Target and Friedman Galleries upstairs. Um, I have the immense pleasure to introduce today Joan Jonas, a visual artist and pioneer of video and performance art. Joan has continued to play a key role for younger artists working today, and I'm really thrilled that we could present her work in dialogue with younger artists in the galleries. Joan's work moves nimbly between disciplines and media, encompassing drawing, video, live performance, installations, and is characterized by a great sense of collaboration. And over the years, Joan has worked with a number of uh, dancers, musicians, performers, actors. Her works, which are known for their innovative use of text, image, and sound, and storytelling, employ diverse references, including feminist theory, Japanese theater traditions of no and kabuki, rituals, magic shows, shadow plays, and children's games. Joan's works reach back into time immemorial, to geological time of the earth, to ancient icons and gods drawing on myths and folk tales and brings those right into the present, looking at urgent contemporary concerns with animal extinction and climate change. To experience Joan's multi-layered works is to become immersed in a set of rich visual slips and rhymes, a unique, poet, uh, in a unique world in which poetry, animals, songs, and mass protagonists are combined to open up our assumptions around perception, illusion, and narrative. Working between visual arts and performing arts, Joan is really an artist who I think is very much aligned with the way that the walker thinks about how art is made. But in many ways, um, we're kind of catching up with you today, Joan, because we have a very limited exhibition history with you. So I'm thrilled that we can really be here and celebrate your work today. Thank you. So we will talk for about 45 minutes, maybe an hour, and then open up to questions. We have quite a lot of slides to go through. Um, and we'll start just by talking about how, as an artist, you learned to see. And we have a few slides here that um, relate to your first experiences of looking at objects, looking at art. And um, I'd love to hear from you about some key influences, including Giacometti, Renaissance painting, and how these moments of looking informed your sense of perception, framing, and composition. All at once. All at once. <laughs> Thank you. Um, th thank you for your introduction. Um, well, just to begin at the beginning, what you see is a, an image of a, um, a tomb sculpture, Egyptian tomb sculpture, where, in which um, tombs uh, included miniature reproductions of, of where the pharaoh had lived. And I think this is a marketplace. I can't quite see. But uh, so I, I would say I didn't really consider myself an artist until I was about 30. <laughs> so um, what we're going to talk about is, is the process probably that led to that, although without the awareness of where it would lead. It was just simply the pr uh, appreciation and curiosity about, about um, art, because my family was interested in going to the Metropolitan Museum. My mother took me there when I was a child. And um, I was fascinated with these miniature scenes, which is the one, thing, one of the things that I remember um, seeing as a child. And, um, and then on from there, I just continued to be, to love art, actually. When sa people say, why did you become an artist? Or why did you begin? I just say, I loved it. And I think I uh, was fascinated by it without knowing that I would be an artist. I think also I will say that as a woman um, at that time, um, some women did have that kind of um, self-confidence. I did not have the confidence to think that I could be an artist. I'll have to say that just at the beginning. When did that confidence well, come? Well, it came gradually, uh, gradually, as I um, began to make things and find my language and so on. And I'll just say, also, I had no choice. It was just, at some point, I had to do that. And I would wake up in the morning saying, should I do something else? No, I couldn't. I just had to go in that on that in that way, but um, but it wasn't like. Although I drew and painted as a child, I went to a progressive school in New York uh, called Walt Whitman, and in kindergarten, first grade, I would come to class, and they'd say, "What would you like to do today?" And I would always say, "Paint. I want to paint," and that's all I did. So I didn't learn how to read and write in a progressive school, and so they took me out of that school and put me somewhere else. <laughs> 
So let's look at the next slide here, um, Il Sassetta and this particular this particular work that you've referenced a few times. Um, well, I, I, I always talk about uh, some of my favorite Renaissance. Well, this is early Renaissance. Painters, this is Sassetta. And um, I studied art history in college. And again, the reason for that was because I just simply was fascinated. But I like Sassetta and that whole period of early Renaissance because of the, um, I like, a kind of, um, I wouldn't say, use the word primitive, but before it became incredibly sophisticated, it was um, really involved with how the space was divided in a geometric way and how architecture was depicted, as well as the figure in the architecture and the colors. So I to, the colors are beautiful, um, pinks and you know pale grays. And um, in this you see a flying figure I guess it's a saint. I don't know. It seems to have a halo. But you see a flying figure. So I like the magic, um, also the magic references in early Renaissance art before it became more down to earth. Which also brings us to Piero della Francesca. Yeah, Piero Fran della Francesca. These are just a couple of examples. But what I love about his work is, again, the, um, the space of the painting, the physical space and how it's depicted, the architecture and how the figures are placed in the space, how they're, they seem to float a little bit on the this, on this surface of the floor and uh, arranged in the architecture. And I'll just say that all of this led to, when I began to work in performance, uh, I, I thought of space. I was very influenced by this way of looking at space and the idea of on a flat surface how space is depicted. So just like in your work, we're kind of going back in time now with this particular image, which is... Well, this is after um, I went to college. Um, you know, I'm a visual artist. I'm not, I, I know I'm called a performance artist, but for me that doesn't really mean anything. What does it mean, performance art? You know, <laughs> well, it's a complicated thing. But, uh, <laughs> um, so after, when I was, after I graduated from college, I, I went to art school in Boston, to the museum school, and continued to really concentrating on making work. And at one point, and then I moved to New York, and I was married. My husband's best friend was Henry Geltzeller, who was the, cur the, the first modern curator at, Mo at the Met. Anyway, but he, through Henry and another person, Bud Trillin, Calvin Trillin, um, we were informed about what was going on downtown. And so while I was in New York in the early 60s, and um, late 50s, early 60s, I guess, yeah, early 60s. So I saw a lot of performance by dancers and um, artists, Oldenburg, you know, visual artists. And the minute I saw this work, um, I wasn't happy with my sculpture. I didn't think it was any good, frankly. And so I just thought that's what I want to do. It just clicked something in my brain. And I was very attracted to uh, the idea of performing. But I didn't do it right away, so I decided to go to Greece I went to Greece because I wanted to um, explore Minoan art. I was always interested in how things begin, Minoan and Mycenaean, you know, and how things begin in ritual. In this case, it's, it's interesting, later at the end of this lecture, I'll say something about fish. It's interesting that I was drawn to the women in Minoan art swimming with the dolphins, and I'm sure they did swim with the dolphins, actually. And so that's why I went to Greece. And in Greece, I kind of went through the transition and gave myself a chance to um, think, how, how am I going to make this transition into performance and time-based work? We'll get to um, Giacometti in a moment, who's also a key kind of early influence for you. But I wonder if this point maybe you could describe, because travel plays a really important role for you, traveling around the world and looking at different well, cultures. Well, traveling around, I was always interested from the very beginning in other cultures and exploring other cultures far away from my own. And I always liked to go away from home and go to another place. And I'm still doing that, but it's just a natural thing now. Everybody, artists travel, have to travel to do their work. But um, for me, it was a, a form of research from the very beginning. And some of the experience you would have during those travels, as well as objects that you would find, would then come into your work. Yeah, well, actually, like the Surrealists, I collected objects. And um, going to uh, 
flea markets all whenever I could, and also picking up objects in different countries. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about that sense of perspective and layering of space, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the importance of Giacometti early on. I know you asked me that earlier. I mentioned, I'm, I often mention him, and I'm not sure how to explain that, but uh, I can only say that I'm totally drawn to the insubstantiality. Is that a word? Ims it is now. <laughs> <laughs> no, insubstantiality insubst of his work, the thinness, the lightness, and the fact that his figures range from very tall to tiny like this, and how those figures control the whole space. And um, I simply loved his work. That's So um, the Body Electric is an exhibition that really looks at how, over the last five decades, artists have engaged with technology to reimagine reimagine the body and sense of self. And your work and your performances have incorporated screens and scrims, but also live and recorded videos. So, I'm curious if you could um, talk about the sense of the, the video monitor, as you've described it, as an electronic ongoing mirror. Well, when artists first, um, these tools were very completely radical for artists. The, the, um, the porta pack was what um, artists at the time, in the early, late 60s, early 70s, were able to buy and by Sony and um, sit in your studio and able to see yourself um, simultaneously as you were doing something, which was impossible in film, as you know. And so this setup the, with the closed circuit situation, the camera, the monitor, the self, um, Bruce Nauman, and so on, um, artists were simply um, drawn to this. And it was, for me, I had studied film, not in a university or formally, but I had been going to see film for years, and uh, I also wanted to make films. And so I did make two films, but when I worked with filmmakers, Peter Campus and Robert Fiore, I didn't shoot them myself, but now I could shoot my own. I called them films, actually. And from the very beginning, I compared the technology of the video to the technology of film, and I was always making references like, this is from Vertical Roll, where you see the bar going by. If you ever see it, you'll see a bar going by, which is something that happens on the TV monitor that you can record. And it's a reference to the film, the frames going by in a film. And of course, there was a relationship between those two technologies. But all of a sudden, one could make one's own work. And of course, editing was difficult, but you could just go to a place in New York and very quickly put together a sequence of images. Or this has no edits, this piece, vertical roll. So um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how in your lifetime, um, technology has changed so much. And this exhibition really brings together 50 years of artists working with very different technology. But I'm wondering if, with that technic technological change, how has the act of seeing changed in your practice? How has technology shifted the way that you approach the screen? It's a very difficult question. I mean, I haven't thought about that, I have to say. Um, how has it changed? I think uh, one becomes, uh, of course, more and more sensitive, and one looks at pictures very differently, and you notice different things. I could just say, as an example in this show, Teresa Baga's, Trisha. Trisha Trisha. Baga's work, um, I find very interesting because it's very complex, and it's, com it's very, quite different from my work in that it's um, a, a different technology. We won't, I don't know exactly how it was made. but. What's, I think the way that technology has influenced me is that you more and more get used to seeing layers and, and, and concentrating different things at the same time. In Trisha's work, there's writing and there's text, there's voice. There's several things going on, and you probably have to sit through it several times in order to, know, to notice everything. And I think that's one difference. Another one, and then also noticing for me how, well, how did they do that? So I have to try to figure out how that is done. And um, probably all of us are that thinking that when we look. I mean, v video artists, people who make video. But um, I think that's the main thing, is seeing many, the different layers. And also now, people are looking at these little tiny things all the time, which I think is a kind of disease. And actually, um, Vin Vendors made a film that I just saw. It's a five-hour film. Have you ever seen it? About screens. It's great. He made it in the early 90s, before 
people were doing this. He made a film about people becoming so addicted to this that they couldn't do anything else. And it was a real addiction, but I think that we're on our way to that. Let's talk about this next image here, um, which really relates to that idea of, of the electronic ongoing mirror. So um, maybe you could describe, Joan, what's happening here. Well, this is a piece called Organic Honeys. It's a, my first video performance, and it was a piece called Organic Honeys Visual Telepathy. And there was a live camera in the audience. I'm sitting in front of a live camera looking at my image that's passed on to the projection and to the monitor. And I'm, in this particular scene, I'm saying this is, I'm pointing to my right eye, this is my right eye, and then this is my left eye. At the same time, I'm pointing at the, cam at the camera with the fingers overlapping. But to do that, you had to really think because it was very different from looking in a mirror. And so for me, the, because I worked with mirrors before that, that was my main prop. So the segue from the mirror performances and using mirrors extensively to working with video just seemed very related, the way I used the video uh, camera. And this became a piece called Left Side, Right Side. It was autonomous video work. And then this is a little bit later. This is I Want to Live in the Country, where again, you, can ha you see this um, engagement with layering. Well, the minute I got a video camera and started working with the video in the performances, I realized, and it was very obvious that I could work with, so that what you saw just now was a performance in which the audience saw a detail of the performance simultaneously with the live action. So they saw two things going on, except that, yeah, so the detail informed you in a different way of what was going on, what you were seeing live. And that interested me. It was a way of layering. So that was the beginning of the layering. And um, so in this case, I was given a grant to do a piece at WNET that, were, that WNET was sponsoring. Um, artist works and so I, naturally you go to a studio and you think what can I do there what, how can I work with this situation in a way that I can't work I couldn't have done this in my studio so I had two cameras um, trained on the subject of the woman you see in the background and the foreground is, a, is a, another shot of the same picture so the whole piece is um, the images switch back and forth. I, it's, I can't explain it properly. But then the, another layer is myself sitting there and then the red outline. So that interested me. And intercut with these foot, this footage is Super 8, footage shot in Super 8 in Canada where I go for the summer with a handheld camera. So I was juxtaposing this very natural film uh, movement, handheld camera, with this very formal studio. Uh, performance and, shot and shooting and those two were intercut and it was called I Want to Live in the Country. And then here we have um, a still from again where this preoccupation is visible but from a live performance where we see um, uh, in the front the body of a, the performing body and then in the background um, the other cast. Maybe we could talk about this one. Well I'm bit. still obviously I was when people ask me I still say I'm an old-fashioned performance artist, a video artist, because um, I work basically with the same ideas, except um, the content is different and the technology is different. Now we work with color in a different way. So this is a piece I did in Venice when I was in the U.S. pavilion, and this is the performance version of it. Um, so what you're seeing is uh, you see me standing with a board in which is projected a smaller image. I can't remember exactly, I can't see it very clearly. And in the background, there's another back projection. And then you see three children to the side. I was working with children. Those are Jason Moran's twins and a little girl who lives next door to me. This was in 2014, so those twins, they're in my present piece. They're quite a bit bigger. Um, and, and another performer on the left, two others on the left. So this is they come to us without a word. And uh, now my, my video technician can put a picture in the picture you know, in a different way. And I'm holding a screen. So screens have a lot to do with how I work. In The Body Electric, your work is positioned um, in proximity to the Wooster Group. And you 
have a shared history with the Wooster Group. You performed with them on two separate occasions in Nyat School in 1978 and in Brace Up in 1992, which is also when you performed in that piece here in Minneapolis. Could you talk a little bit about your relationship to the Woosters um, and how important that experience was? Well, I'll just start by saying in New York in the um, 60s and 70s, um, it was a sm much smaller community than it is now. And, and everybody, many people knew each other. You know, there was, um, yeah. So they lived around the corner. I lived in the building that they, I was, my loft was in there, in the building that they were in, that the theater was in. And um, so I knew them from the time that Richard Schechner, they came with Richard Schechner to that theater around the corner. So I knew them, and they were friends. And um, I went to see their work. I thought they were among the most interesting uh, theater groups, but I knew other theater groups as Mabu Mines and other Hungarian theater groups. There are many small theater groups. It was very interesting. Doesn't, it's not true now in the same way. Uh, so they're friends, and then they invited me to performing in Nayat School. And that was when Spalding Gray and Ron Vauder were still there. And um, it was really, I can only say, a lot of fun, because Spalding is so funny. I was just laughing all the time. And um, I enjoyed that. It was very simple. But I just played one part of Celia Copplestone from a T.S. Eliot play. And um, I would play my part. I was just in one scene. And then I would go back to my loft and go perform the juniper tree in my loft the same night. So anyway, just another little part of it. Um, and then later, a few years later, then I was in Brace Up. And that was a much more... Uh, kind of difficult and longer uh, process. And uh, yeah, I, I finally had to leave that because it was so, uh, it took away from my own work. And uh, they were, they continuously changed their work and rehearse it, not change it, but perfect it over and over again. So the rehearsals are never over. You never can do the piece. And so it took too much time and um, I had to leave that situation. But that was, yeah, it was very influenced by my work, I have to say. So we're going to talk a little bit about the work Funnel. Um, so after performances in New York and Houston, Cologne, Rome, Funnel was presented on this stage at the Walker in 1974, on October 4th and 5th, um, alongside the exhibition Projected Images. Um, you describe the genesis of the work, and we'll, we'll have a slide in a minute of it being performed here, but this is one of the iterations of the piece. Um, you describe the genesis of the work as a study of the sculptural form of the cone. Can you tell us a little bit about how that work began and what happens during the performance? I will, but I just want to, because you asked me other questions when you sent me the questions about the Worcester Group. So I just want to say, you said why. I think that one reason I wanted to do the second um, the second piece was because I wanted to work with my voice. I had never worked in theater before, and so I really wanted to see what it was like to to memorize lines and to work with my voice. And um, and I'll also say, even though it was difficult, I enjoyed being directed in in a situation. It was um, it, it wasn't my it. I didn't have to worry about my work, so I enjoyed that part. Um, so from the very beginning, I I thought of transferring or translating my experience as a visual artist into my performances. And so I worked with graphic elements. And <coughs> in the early outdoor pieces, um, you'll see a circle and a line. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I worked with the idea of the circle and the line. So uh, I made a circle. Actually, I started developing in Nova Scotia. I made a beach piece. And I worked on the sand, making a circle of rocks and a circle running in the sand um, with a string to make a perfect circle, and then putting posts in the sand to make a line. And so I thought of that motif as the two basic you know, drawing elements. And you see it here. So I repeated it over and over again in different ways in my work. Um, a few years later, that was in 1970 and 71, 72. A few years later, in 1974, I started to work with this piece um, and the piece started, I thought, what form could I work with, which is interesting, is the cone. It's another basic form. And so I thought of the set in the form of a cone, 
you know, it has sloping paper walls. And, uh, and then the cone itself, I made many, many cones. And I still continue to work with cones because it's such a wonderful form. It can be used in so many different ways as an object like this, or it can be used as a sound device. I use it to channel sound around the room. Or, and then I use it in different ways to listen, to look through, and so on as a telescope. So there are many references for the cone. And um, so that's how this piece began. And then the circle and the line. The hoop was from an earlier work from the late 60s. And I reused my props over and over again also and um, recycled them. And also the hoop and the poles, circle and the line. And this still is, I think, at the beginning of the performance when you pull a live rabbit out of the desk. And you can see on the monitor um, a live feed of, of what's, what, you're, what you're performing. Um, could you talk a little bit about what, what is happening during the performance? Well, it, uh, it's very um, simple. I come on, I sit in the desk, and I very slowly, it's all very slow motion. I open the desk, and there's a live rabbit in the desk. And I take the rabbit out, and I hold it. And then I put it back in the desk. I don't close the top. And the rabbit stayed in the desk, I think, throughout the performance. Somebody may have gotten come out and taken the poor little thing uh, away, put it in a more comfortable place. But um, it was a reference to magic shows, which magic shows had a big influence on my work. And so during the performance, just briefly, um, I, I take their different layers, and I take those curtains away um, one by one so that you see each layer. And I do different performative actions in each of the layers. And um, the video is a reflection of what's going on live. And then in this next image, you can see the tin butterfly in front of the screen. Yeah, well, here I'm doing a very, everybody who ever had a video camera did what I've done. I went, you know, you put your hand in front of the monitor and you get this um, infinite um, feedback. It's a feedback effect that you get when you point the camera at the monitor. And I started doing, I, I went back to that in the, in the 2000s, and one of my old friends who's a video artist came in and he said, God, I saw that and it was, it, I know it was you. <laughs> when I, saw, well, I mean, a lot of people use feedback, but um, I continue to use it in the present. And then here you are in Minneapolis. Yeah, well, so this piece um, changed and uh, developed. Every time I did it, I did it slightly differently. And um, I think the one in Minneapolis was quite different from the others. By the way, you know, I realized, of course, that there was, the hoop is covered in the early ones, you know, the early, but I think it's better for it not to be covered if, as an installation. So when I go, um, I'm very, I feel very grateful and happy that it's been chosen to be, re, re, to, to be shown again. Um, this is the first time that it's been shown in this way, just as an installation, without a performance. But um, when, whenever I re bring something back, I don't necessarily show it exactly the way it was. But I will say that this piece is not a translation. The way I say that many of my performance pieces, when they're turned into installations, the translation, you take it apart and put it back together in a different way. But these, these early, some of these early pieces are exactly the way they were because I thought of them as stage sets, as kind of sculptural situations. So we'll get to also the show that was in 76 stage sets, but here are just a couple of images from the installation upstairs. So you can see it's slightly different, but those key um, objects that you've been working with, the hoop, the cone, the screens, the desk, are there. And the video. And the video. So here's just a couple of images. Before we finished tweaking the installation, I see the desk isn't fully open with the flashlight. And then there. So let's talk about, this leads us into um, stage sets, which is, um, we'll get to that in a minute. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about how you think of these different elements and how they permeate throughout your practice, how they come back, how you rework them. Well, this is in my loft in New York when I was working on a piece called Mirage and developing it, working with the TV monitor on its side. And I never, this is something I made in my loft. It's a kind of tent structure. 
um, as you can see. And it's a photograph of me improvising with the cone in the background, uh, taken by a friend of mine, Gwen Thomas. And we were making a poster, actually, that's why we were doing this. This never became something, but I think Mirage is when I started. Well, the idea of the screen runs throughout the work from the very beginning. The monitor being a kind of screen, the screen of the projection, the projected image, the screen in a movie theater. And so for this, I was getting ready for a performance at the Anthology Film Archives, where they have a moving screen, and a, a screen that you can manipulate, expand, contract, and change the shape of a rectangle, a square. And um, I became very interested in that. I mean, I worked with that at Anthology. Mm -hmm. And then in a lot of your work, you're using um, masks, headpieces as disguises, creating um, alter egos and personas. And then this is an image, I think you said from Houston when Funnel was performed, and you're wearing um, a chador. Um, and in the exhibition, you included a statement about that particular piece of clothing. I wonder if you could talk about its use in 1974 versus today. Well, I use it in all the, work, all the Funnel pieces I use. <coughs> I'll just say, I'll just um, tell how I got. There was a store on West Broadway run by an Italian woman named Luxor. And um, she was there until two years ago. It's amazing, on West Broadway. And she um, and her husband used to go to Afghanistan, which was very common. I mean, um, um, the Italian artist who made so many works. Boetti. Boetti, I should know, because I knew him. But anyway, he went there off and did a lot of work in Afghanistan. So it was very natural for artists to have a relationship to Afghanistan. Again, the idea of the far away. And um, I was drawn, as I said before, to other cultures. When I went to Israel, I, I bought a Palestinian headdress. And you'll see that in vertical roll. But I didn't think about it as representing Palestinians. I just thought it was a beautiful object. Uh, piece of material. And it seemed natural. Everybody was wearing them. So I bought four or five of these Chaudhry's in um, Luxor's store. And I've, I think it's complicated now to, to both talk about it and to, to explain. So in a way, I have no real explanation. I can just say I thought they were, um, I love the shape. Again, it relates to the idea of the cone. Uh, it, it was a mask that covered my body. And I'll say that I use masks a lot because I was not an experienced performer. I never worked in theater. And so I liked to cover my face. Also, I didn't want to be Joan Jonas. I wanted to be other, I wanted to be something else, other characters. Um, when I wore the Chaudhry, I was not trying to be an Af Afghani woman at all. I was just, maybe it sounds naive, I was using it because I thought it was a beautiful, um, a beautiful object, a beautiful costume, a beautiful thing. I think now it has a very different significance and I would not, I would never um, use it now or put it on. And I don't even include it in my installations of this piece. There are a couple of images here um, which look for, uh, very similar to the way that the work is presented in the galleries now. Um, so there's this and then a still from the video. So this is 1976. This is only two years after Funnel, which is when you had a show um, at the ICA in Philadelphia where you presented your stage sets. And as we look through the images, there'll be, again, the screens, the cones, um, the accountant's chair, the desks, uh, they recur. How Can you talk about the significance of this particular show um, for you at that moment? Well, I was invited by Suzanne Delahunty to, to do a show at the ICA, and the ICA has this big central space. And um, I don't remember how it came about, but I knew that I wanted to do an installation of one of my stage sets. But I didn't do it exactly. It was based on, obviously, it came out of Funnel, and it had other elements. It also was a kind of, had a relationship to the juniper tree, which is, at this point, um, I began to work with fairy tales in 1976, after doing a, a number of video performances, um, a different one every year or two, working with different relationships of the monitor and the camera to the projection, to the performance. 
I wanted to uh, I, I didn't I wanted to give up the video uh, working with video for a while and I wanted to work with um, something different storytelling and so I that's when I began to work with fairy tales and so this first one the Grimm Brothers fairy tale the juniper tree um, I thought of the different elements of the juniper tree there was a house and other other things but the the roof roof represents the the house then I wanted to make a sp space for performance and so I use paper walls they're different a little bit they're you can see they're far apart and then in the background there was a table a sloping table a large one which became a stage for the juniper tree when I performed it in the kitchen so all these works kind of transformed themselves and segued from one form to another um, and then we did a performance for children in this space um, of the juniper tree which was very interesting it was the first time I did it's a very brutal story but I read Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment, luckily, because the mothers all came up to him right before the performance and said, oh my God. And, and I referred to Bruno Bettelheim, who says that these stories are teaching stories for children to overcome fear. And that was what interested me about, one of the things that interested me about fairy tales. And they accepted that. The children really liked it because the children love witches and they love wicked characters and so on. Maybe at this point you could just offer a brief synopsis of the juniper tree and the brutality of the yeah. story. Um, well, the juniper tree, is it, it starts with a happy family, mother and father, and um, um, a daughter. No, a son. And um, the, good, the good mother dies, and the father marries a second woman who's the bad mother. But the, ch the, ch the daughter and the father don't know this. So they have a little boy, and the bad mother wants everything for her little girl. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. And so um, she gets the daughter to, I haven't told this story in a long time. She gets the daughter, I don't know, she puts apples in a trunk, and then she tells the daughter to close, the little boy goes in and tries to get the apple, and the little, she tells the little girl to close the trunk and cuts his head off. And... Um, the little girl sort of realizes what she's done, but not quite. The mother takes the little boy, cuts him up, and cooks him in a stew and feeds him to the father. The little girl's under the table while the father is eating, and the father throws his bones, the bones of the boy, under the table. The little girl gathers them up and takes them outdoors and puts them on the, under the juniper tree, which is out in the yard. And then, to make a long story short, the, the little boy is transformed and rises like a a bird from the juniper tree and flies off and, and then comes back three times and keeps dropping things. I think she brings presents for the little girl, the, the um, boy. And then finally, the little boy drops a huge stone on the mother and the mother dies. And the little boy comes back as the little boy. Anyway, so. So really appropriate for young children. Yeah, yeah. really good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, which is but also. Which is also a piece you then, like with many of your works, you then reworked it into different iterations. So there was the children's version. For, for the children, there was also two or three other versions of this piece that um, that you created. No, there was the children's version, which was at this at the ICA, sort of in this set. <coughs> and then I did a version because I wanted to get back. I worked with two um, friends, Tim Burns and Lindsay Smith, and then... Um, Pouquet, a dancer, and Linda Zadikin, another friend. And we made a, I wanted to make a kind of like a Chinese uh, fairy tale version in which we used a lot of props and that table. And we did that in the kitchen. And we had lighting. It was very theatrical. And then I felt like I myself was getting away from it. So I did a third version, which was a solo piece, in which I did a lot of, um, I made a structure, um, like a sculptural structure of wood and string, and, and all these things that roof kept changing its form. I, I can't really describe the whole thing to you, but yeah, so there were three different versions, and the third was a solo piece that I did, and I played all the parts. So there are a few images more here. There's a nice affinity with Fano, the reappearance of the butterfly, and then the chairs, and then you can't quite see it, but on the wall is a, a drawing that references um, 
A mirror in Da Vinci? Is well, that it's right? a Da Vinci drawing. A mirror. There, lines reflect of reflection in a mirror. Very abstract drawing, a beautiful drawing, which I copied. I copy drawings. And then here is Organic Honey, 1972. We talked a little bit about alter egos and personas and you not wanting to be performing as Joan. Is there anything you'd like to add about Organic Honey? It's a work that No, I'll just here. say that when I began to work with video, um, I immediately started using... I'd been to Japan and very influenced by the No Theater. And um, so I started using masks in my outdoor works and then in 72 in Organic Honey to uh, transform my myself into another character. And so I use masks and costumes to do that. And this Organic Honey visual telepathy vertical role it was a two-year project and I worked continuously on the performance, transforming it, and also making autonomous video works that came out of the process of making the performance. So these elements of both were exchanged and included. And this piece was the main purpose of this piece, or content, was um, exploring the idea of whether or not there's such a thing as female identity. And so that's why I work with disguises. And at the time, the women's movement was very, of course, it had started before that, but in the late 60s and early 70s, it was very strong and a big concern. And um, so this was a reflection of my involvement with that question. And when was the time for you, was it in, in the 90s when you started creating installations, changing these? So here we have... Um, the installation version of, of uh, or the extension of Organic Honey. I'm wondering what was the moment in which you started well, considering I think stage these? sets, actually. Mm -hmm. Stage sets was the first installation. And that's why I never brought it back, but then it was just brought back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here, but, I know you want to talk about fish. No, but so I'll, I'll, talk, I'll answer your question quickly. So I, was, I had a show at the Stadelik Museum in 1994, and um, that was when I translated like four or five pieces into installations. And in the early work, the sounds of all the different videos that I made in relation to the organic honey piece played together. And the sounds came together in, in a way. But I've continued to work that way, and I still work that way. And we have here also, this is, before we get to the fish, we have to talk about rabbits. Um, so we have, this is glass puzzle that some of you might have seen. We show this at the Walker, I think two or three years ago. And then here is a, a great drawing of a rabbit, and rabbit appear. the rabbit appears, of course, in Funnel as well. Um, the rabbit is a, an animal that you've worked with quite a few times. Well, yeah, I just came back. I did, these, I did several pieces in Japan, and one of them was called um, Double Lunar Rabbits, Rabbit, because it was based on the idea of the rabbit in the moon. So they don't have a man in the moon. They have a rabbit in the moon. And the rabbit is making um, sticky rice pounding rice and it's a it's a it's a fairy tale japanese story the rabbit it's it's a more yeah it's about a rabbit who um goes out with two other animals they run into a wise man anyway the rabbit just always says i will give you my life and it's a, a lesson for children and adults and that that piece is also a kind of meditation on more um uh cross-cultural um icons and symbols because it also you relate that also to the aztec um Story well, I just rabbit. mentioned because when I, in all my work, I mean the juniper tree. Also, I traced that from Egypt, the myth of Osiris, who was cut up into many parts and spread all over Egypt, and then Isis came and gathered them all together. And um, I think this is a recurring. And I think that fairy tales and and myth traveled, you know, from the east across Europe. I'm sure influenced by not. The Grimm brothers didn't know it, but I'm sure those those stories they were from the oral tradition had a big relation to each other. And so when I worked on the rabbit story, I looked it up, of course, and then I found that a similar story in the Aztec Mexican tradition, which is amazing. I mean, it just shows how people traveled and exchanged information and stories. And drawing is something that's... You've repeatedly emphasized that that's something that's very important to you. You draw frequently, you make discrete drawings, you draw during your performances. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, how you've been returning to this kind of really elemental, basic way of well, creating I've, no, I've always, from the very beginning, um, 
included drawing because I wanted to include something that concerned me, and drawing was always a basic part of my work. And I thought it was, you know, it, it, uh, it underlies every form of art, drawing. And so, and it interested me, to, I thought of myself as learning how to draw from life, you know, when I began to go to art school and so on. So it just became an interest and also um, a pleasurable action. So in each one of my works, I try, I, I, I include drawings, and the drawings have a relationship to the technology. When I started working with video, I drew in relation to the monitor. So one way I worked with drawing in relation to video was to draw while looking at the um, video screen and not looking at the paper. So I give myself tasks. They're like handicaps, you could say. And the drawings either have something to do with the subject matter or the technology or the scale. So you could make a little tiny drawing on the video and the audience could see it. Or later on, I made big drawings um, with this long stick, the way I have to say, mention Matisse, the way he made drawings, and, um, and so on. So I've just continued to, drawings are part of the content. I think we'll turn to questions soon. There are just a couple more slides. You're referencing the beach piece, which is. There's the hoop. Yeah. There's the hoop. Um, and then there's also. That's this Mirage. Is Mirage, which comes right after Funnel. Um, this is called After Mirage. And it was a piece I did um, in, this, in 76 in the Green Street space, which was an alternative space near my, where I lived. And, and then it was just brought back by. Um, a curator, maybe eight or ten years ago, and now it exists as a piece in paper and in tin, and it includes a monitor with um, May windows, which was part of Mirage. And then, but I'll just say I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. And then this is the final slide that we have. Yeah. Where again? We That's from they come to us without a word, and you can see I still uh, work with cones. They're magic shapes. So I think we'll, um, we have a couple of mics in the audience, and we'd love to open up to questions. Um, if you have a question, there'll be a mic on either side. There's a question in the front here. Oh, we'll start there. Ms. Jonas, um, could you describe how your work relates to the idea of authenticity or of the copy, and how that, I don't know, where your personal interest in that came from? I don't have a personal interest in authenticity. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what you mean by that. But I do, and I also don't, my work is not in any way primarily concerned with the copy. But of course, um, working in video, everything is a copy. So I may, the videos can be copied infinitely. And um, every artist, almost, I mean, many artists when they begin, they begin by copying. That's one way to begin to learn how to draw. And so uh, I used to copy Gorky. I copied, I wish I could find them. I can't find those drawings. But I copied the portrait of his, him and his mother over and over. I love that. And then the copy, yeah. I've copied not a lot, but a few um, drawings from other cultures that have become, like this one called The Endless Drawing. It's from the Malukian Book of the Dead, and it's a New Guinea tribe. And it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a, seri a whole series of different images relating to a grid pattern, and it has to do with going from life to death. But I don't do that anymore. But I make my own copies now. I just, when I do it, a show um, which stays up for a long time. I copy my own drawings because they don't survive. I want them to hang without frames. So, And in Funnel, there's the screen print of, on the material on the cloth that's on the floor. There's the yeah, that's a copy. But yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. But I never think of authentic. What is authentic? I mean, why do you ask the question? Um, specifically in relation to your work that deals with the women's movement. So the idea of an authentic self or a singular idea of womanhood. And so your work seems to be challenging that in some ways. So I was wondering what you had to say about that. OK, I'm glad I should have asked you that right away. Mm 
Um, no, I don't have any idea of a single self. I don't think it exists, really. Um, I think everybody um, forms oneself. Um, and I think that was the main question in the women's movement was, and right now, you know, it's become more and more of an, a question and a development from that, what you just mentioned, um, that the self is shifting and also can be transformed and gender included in that. So I think those ideas began a while ago, if, that answer, if that's what you are referring to. There's a question in the middle there. Um, Joan, hi. Um, thank you so much for this very um, illuminating uh, conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to be cheeky and push in two uh, questions, and you could just choose with it, whichever you find more uh, interesting. First one is about something you touched on when you were talking about that moment in the late 1960s, when sort of the closed circuit video sort of a construction allowed artists to see themselves in a very sort of mediated way, perhaps. And I found that very interesting, and you touched on it in the uh, conversation as well, sort of the move or sort of transition from using sort of the mirror in your work to sort of the video screen. And uh, Pavel, I think you said you sort of referenced the screen as this kind of like uh, electronic uh, mirror, if you will. And maybe to go a little bit more into that, because I mean, in the performance work, sort of the mirror was also sort of a technique to include sort of the audience in the image somehow, you know? And I'm just wondering how the mirror as a reflection of the self, literally, but also an inclusion of multiple people in an image, how you relate that to the beginning of when you started using videos and screens in your work. It's just maybe perhaps another way into the uh, conversation. Um, second question is, you said that sort of a, a travel is really important for you. Where haven't you been that you would really like to go? That's an easier question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see, I'd like to go to uh, um, Sicily. I'd like to go to, I missed my chance to go to the Australian desert. I mean, there are many places, but I'm, I know I'm not going to go. I travel too much already. But, yeah, um, the first question, now I've lost track of the first question. Um, I mean, it was natural the audience was reflected, and one, the minute one starts using a prop, things happen. And so when I got the mirror, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to do a piece where the audience is reflected. I just started working with the mirrors, with people carrying the mirrors, and, and that's something that came from naturally from that situation. The mirrors for me were more like they changed the space of perception. When, I, when we worked in the rehearsals, um, there wasn't an audience. There wasn't an audience until we actually performed a very choreographed movement. Um, I'm sorry, your question, I've lost track. Do you remember what he? The relationship between, as I understood it, Hendrik, when you were talking about mirrors, including the audience, including the spectator, to turning to video as being more focused on Joan herself, on the self, rather than including spectators that move from... Well, I guess it explains why I didn't think of it that way. And um, I think the whole process it was very interesting. I didn't do that on purpose either, was having a mirror stage, <laughs> and then, you know, and then, then going on to video. Um, I was also finding myself, uh, in relation to your question, I was finding myself, uh, who am I? And uh, as a performer, what am I? And I thought of myself as um, making my own rituals in my own community. And so there were many references to, to myth and storytelling that I never expressed verbally. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't really. I'm, it's a difficult. I'd love to have a personal conversation with you <laughs> afterwards, maybe. Or yeah, because um, I think I'd have to talk quite a bit to answer. I think we have time for two or two questions. There's one here in the front. Uh, thanks very much for your talk and, and conversation. Um, earlier, right at the beginning, you, you were when you were talking about the Minoan art, you said you're so fascinated by where it all began and the source. 
I guess, sources of culture. How about where it all ends? As it, how do you, what's your insight now as a mature artist, still vibrant, still working? Do you, you're talking about the places that you won't go. Like, how, did, how has that influenced your work and, and uh, what have you learned? The places that I won't position? go. Well, now the position that you're in now. I mean, how does, how does, it, how does it affect your work when you approach it uh, from, from the point of view of... Are you asking how I see the world? Y yes, as a, as a mature artist, yes. I mean, it, well, I'll say my latest art. piece, I'll just tell you about my latest piece, which is up now in Venice. And I've been working on it for a few years, and it concerns the oceans. And uh, um, the piece before that reanimation, and they come to us without a word, I began to think about the environment. Because reanimation was based on a Haldor Laxness book called Under the Glacier. So, of course, I bring everything into the present, and so glaciers are melting. And then I thought of nature and um, his beautiful descriptions of nature. I've always loved the outdoors and worked a lot in the outdoors. And so just leading up to this piece about, it was commissioned by um, an organization, TBA21, who, that is devoted to saving the ocean or become, making, and having people become more aware of what's happening in the ocean. And so this piece that I'm working on now, it's called Moving Off the Land. And um, it involves fish, and I filmed, uh, it's not a story, but it, in, it involves quite a bit of information. And my information for this particular piece came from um, reading the New York Times science section, reading books about, um, say, the soul of the octopus, um, other minds. So I found out a lot about what's in the ocean and under the water. and. Um, I'm very concerned, as we all should be, about the environment. And so this piece is, if any of you go to Venice, you'll see it. So a lot of, so there's, it's this multi-channel work. A lot of it shot in aquariums. I shot um, footage in aquariums around the world. But I also working with a marine biologist, David Kruber, who's uh, developed cameras and lenses to film fluorescent um, creatures under the water. He's a diver. I'm not that kind of a diver, but they want me to do that. I mean, Sylvia Earle came to the opening, and she insists that I'm going to become a diver. She's my age, and so I'm a little bit nervous. She wants me to go down in a bathosphere. Anyway, but no, I'll just say, and also as far as the way you ask how I, my vision changed. Um, first, there was the early work with the relation of the camera. And then there was, uh, I started in the 90s making video backdrops that were parallel stories. And then quickly to the present, um, those have developed into uh, projected videos that I perform in quite a bit. I wear white and I become part of the picture. Um, and so working with these virtual images, I don't work with um, interactive uh, uh, technology. You know, I don't include the audience in that way, as some of the people do in this show. But I think working, I've never had this experience before, working with this piece, performing with the fish has, you know, it affects me physically. Uh, it affects my body and my mind. So I think I'm with the fish in, in a strange way. I never had that experience before. But so more and more I'm really upset by what's going on in the world, as far as the environment and the creatures and so on. I'm sure most of you know what's going on, but, you know, we should all give up plastics. <laughs> I mean, it's horrifying. I still use plastic bags, I have to say. And I, was, I quoted Sylvia Earle in the piece, and she said we should give the ocean back, and she never eats fish anymore. And um, I quoted her, and I have to explain to people, no, that's not me talking at Sylvia Earle. But I think about that more and more, I have to say. I think we have time for one last question. I saw a hand shoot right up there in the middle. Um, I do you mind just, we're recording, do you mind waiting for the microphone? Thank you, I'm very, very, very inspired by your work. I'm a teacher and I, anyway, I swim and whatever. But, um, <laughs> and I love your crystals and I'm making all these crystal things. What are your crystals, uh, is that a, why did you work with crystals? And then you have fish. And then that one piece I saw, I'm from San Francisco, where you're walking amongst these houses in the woods, in the grasses with a white 
outfit. Which piece did you see in San Francisco? It was on. It was a video of you walking, and there must have been ten or fifteen houses, little miniature houses. Oh yeah. Um, well, I go to Canada in the summer, and I have a friend who has an antique store. I'll just say quickly. I get many of my props from him, and he had this whole village, miniature village, which I bought. And I've used it over and over again. I just love it. They're little houses. And, um, and, and then I had children rearrange them. That was part of a video for a Dante piece based on Dante, the children rearranging the houses continuously. But when I started working with the under the glacier and the idea of glaciers and snow and melting, um, I thought crystals are... I just was walking by a store with a friend of mine on on left on on the Bowery and I saw those crystals hanging I thought oh I have to use those then I did the piece in Venice and um I've just been buying boxes and boxes of Venetian glass crystals and became interested in making I did, I had a lamp I made a lamp for that piece so I'll just say that they're you know I just gradually um I use crystals in reanimation, and I use them as a kind of optical device. So I shot the film, I projected uh, the video through it, and shot that projection, and um, and use them in different ways. So if that explains it a little bit, um, thank you for what you said, Joan. I thank you so much for being here. I can't believe it took us 45 years to have you back on the stage. Um, we're really grateful that you created the work in the galleries for the show. It's, um, we're really thrilled. Um, before we finish, I want to thank also Eleanor and Bobby Kerr, who supported the talks program for the show. And um, finally, please come back at 3. In the cinema, we'll have a conversation between Zach Blass, uh, whose commission Icosahedron is right outside of the cinema in the lobby, in conversation with Chris Balson. Thank you. I just want to thank you and to thank the, um, Walker for having me back. It's great to come back after all these years. Thank you. Thank you.